Hello, Sean here again, That History Guy, and we're continuing our investigation of the historical context of the James Bond movies. This is number 11, not counting the introduction, and we're on a film that arrived at an absolutely crucial historical moment, Moonraker, released in June 1979. I've been looking forward this entire series to doing the entry on Moonraker, not because it's a particularly good film in the Bond franchise, it isn't, but the history surrounding Moonraker is really, really fascinating. And what was going on in the world at that time totally changes the course of the franchise and the world. Barely two years separated the release of Moonraker from its predecessor, The Spy Who Loved Me. But the world changed tremendously in those two years. So much so that you could say that Moonraker was released in a different era. The momentous history of this time begins with one person. And here she is. Margaret Thatcher, the so-called Iron Lady. In May 1979, barely seven weeks before the release of Moonraker, Margaret Thatcher came to power as Prime Minister of Great Britain. The world at large and the world of James Bond would never be the same again. This is not the first time that Maggie has popped up in our story. I mentioned her in the context of the 1974 film, The Man with the Golden Gun, because 1974 was the year that Margaret Thatcher was poised for the first time on the brink of national-level stature in Britain. Thatcher started 1974 as Education Secretary, not a very powerful position. But in February 1975, she replaced Edward Heath as the leader of the Conservative Party, which made her the leader of the opposition. The story of Thatcher's rise from education secretary to prime minister is the story of how the world changed between the time of The Spy Who Loved Me in 1977 to Moonraker's release in 1979. Politically and culturally, between 1977 and 1979, the Western world was poised for a conservative resurgence. Traditional conservative ideology stressing privatization, big business, and small governments had been generally discredited in the activist 60s, and it had a decidedly mixed record in the 1970s. Both Richard Nixon in America and Edward Heath in Britain had their share of disasters, and both left office prematurely. In the late 1970s, though, conservatism got rebooted, so to speak. Margaret Thatcher brought a certain kind of nostalgic patriotic nationalism to the conservative movement. She adopted the rhetorical style of Winston Churchill, for example, and she promised, not in these words, but basically promised more or less to make Britain great again. And she did this by appealing to traditional values, especially moral values, that conservatives argued had been overlooked in the 60s and 70s. In America, at the same time, ideological and social conservatism was also rising rapidly. Religious conservatives, the so-called moral majority founded by Jerry Falwell, these people were especially concerned with rolling back the social progress of the 60s. And this fused with the Barry Goldwater-style free market and nationalist ideology that came together perfectly in the candidacy of former cowboy movie actor Ronald Reagan, who was essentially Margaret Thatcher's opposite number on the other side of the Atlantic. Political and economic developments in 1978 and 79, the time when Moonraker was in production, gave both of these leaders their chance at power. In Britain, a labor crisis came about which came to be known as the Winter of Discontent. This was a series of strikes by labor, various labor unions who were protesting wage and salary caps instituted by Prime Minister James Callaghan in an effort to control runaway inflation. The wave of strikes brought Britain's economy to a standstill in the winter of 1978 and 79. For instance, one of the industries that went on strike was truck drivers. Truck drivers who delivered gasoline, among other things, this meant that gas stations ran dry, fuel oil couldn't be delivered to homes, and people uh, uh, couldn't heat their homes. This was occurring, of course, during one of the coldest winters in the 20th century in Britain. Garbage collectors went on strike. Even grave diggers went on strike. At one point, some British towns were storing dead bodies in abandoned factories. That's how bad the situation got. James Callaghan seemed insensitive to the suffering of the British people, in part because of a series of gaffes in the media. As a result, his Labour Party sank like a rock at the polls. In 1978, Callaghan's government had decided not to call a general election that year, which surprised most people. On March 28, 1979, after all the turmoil of the winter of discontent, however, 
Parliament held a vote of no confidence against Callaghan, forcing an election in early May 1979. The winter of discontent basically handed power to Margaret Thatcher on a silver platter. She and her conservatives campaigned on one of the most effective slogans in British political history, Labor Isn't Working. When the dust settled and the votes were counted, Maggie basically wiped the floor with Labour, scoring 339 seats in Parliament and the biggest swing of seats from one party to another in a British election since Churchill's defeat in 1945. The election of 1979 was a sea change in Britain. Labour would remain out of power for most of the next 20 years, until 1997, two James Bond actors and eight movies later. You can tell just from this that Margaret Thatcher is going to be playing a huge role in the background of the James Bond story. The making of Moonraker subtly reflects what was going on in Britain at this time. Because of the economic crisis, corporate taxes in Britain in 1978 were very, very high. To cut costs, therefore, the producers made the decision to film as much of the picture as possible outside of Britain, principally in France. And in fact, Moonraker is technically an Anglo-French production. Instead of being shot at the traditional Pinewood Studios in England, most of the sets were built in France. The actor who plays the villain, Hugo Drax, is a French actor, Michael Lonsdale. It was originally supposed to be James Mason. Various other members of the cast and crew were French. And the film was also shot in addition to France in Venice and Brazil, basically anywhere but London. Moonraker tries to take advantage of the two big cultural trends of 1978, Star Wars and Disco. The next film after Spy Who Loved Me was originally supposed to be for your eyes only, but Albert Broccoli, the producer, changed it to Moonraker to cash in on the science fiction craze that was then sweeping the film industry as a result of George Lucas's Star Wars. The years 1978 and 79 saw dozens of cheap Star Wars knockoffs rushed into production. Most of them were pretty bad. The most well-remembered of these Star Wars clones was probably Star Crash, uh, which in fact uh, starred Carolyn Monroe, who had been in The Spy Who Loved Me. The Bond series, however, had a chance not only to cash in on Star Wars mania, but to rise above the cheap knockoffs, because the Bond films traditionally commanded high budgets and production values. As a result, the key sequence of Moonraker is a space battle, created with special effects by Derek Meddings, who was sort of the British equivalent of John Dykstra, the effects guy who had done Star Wars and in 1978 was working on Battlestar Galactica for TV. Narratively, the space battle in Moonraker is kind of corny, but at least it's fun to watch. Disco makes its final appearance in the James Bond series in Moonraker. John Barry was back composing the score and included on this soundtrack, uh, playing over the uh, closing credits, is a disco beat version of the theme song sung by Shirley Bassey. The song, incidentally, was written and recorded very hastily. It was originally supposed to be sung by Johnny Mathis. Disco was getting a little long in the tooth by 1979, but it hadn't yet died out completely. Moonraker premiered in late June 1979 and was a huge hit. At that time, Ronald Reagan was running for the Republican presidential nomination in the United States, and in 1979, and particularly 1980, the U.S. would go through its own political and economic crisis, similar to the one in Britain, which would bring Reagan and his conservative coalition to power at the end of 1980. I'll talk about that process in the next video about the next Bond film, for your eyes only. In the meantime, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.